Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, hello and welcome on behalf of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action to the launch of the Primary Prevention Framework for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Um, we are looking forward to our time today and to launching this very important resource. Um, my name is Michelle Van Aken and I work with Plan International USA. I will be your moderator during this webinar um, and accompanying you on this journey. Um, I think we all have the definition of child protection memorized by heart. Um, it is the prevention of and response to violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation of children. Child protection practitioners globally have a wealth of tools to respond to harm when it has happened, um, from case management to demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration of children associated with armed forces and armed groups. We are adept at identifying child protection risks and supporting those most vulnerable to them. However, where we are lacking in guidance is on how we can prevent harm um, across a population before it can even occur. To use public health language, what, um, to use some public health language I think we all might be familiar with at this point, uh, what vaccine can we use to prevent the virus of child protection risks from taking root and causing harm? It was with this question in mind that the Alliance with funding from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance embarked on a two year long project to develop a primary prevention framework for child protection and humanitarian action. We are very excited to launch this cornerstone resource today. Before diving into our lineup of presentation, let's just take care of some housekeeping. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Alliance YouTube page. Um, we encourage all attendees to use the chat to share your comments or your own experiences in primary prevention. And we'd like to invite you to use the Q&A function to ask questions that will be addressed in writing or during the Q&A section later in the event. Um, please also feel free to introduce yourself to others in the chat with your name, your position, and where you're calling in from. We love to know who's joining us and from where in the world. Um, we will be having three presentations today. First, Toby Mbaya will share a multi-sectoral case study on prevention in Nigeria. Then Susan Wisniewski, who led the development of the framework, will then connect this case study to the framework, using this as an opportunity opportunity to introduce the concept of prevention and launch the framework as a resource for child protection actors globally. We will wrap up with a presentation from Joyce Laker of, a, um, of AVC Foundation, where you will be able to see the principles of prevention programming in action. However, we will first start with opening remarks from Debbie Landis, Humanitarian Protection Advisor at the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, on behalf of USAID and the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And we're really excited about the launch of this new initiative. We'd especially like to thank Plan International, the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, and UNICEF, as well as so many partners throughout the world who have made this process possible. Across the globe, we know that children face multiple risk, including exposure to violence, exploitation, and many forms of harm. We also know that these risks are exacerbated in emergency contexts, and that this has been magnified even more in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Exposure to violence has been associated with a host of negative consequences to children's health, education, and overall well-being, both in the short term as well as throughout their lifespan. Although multiple risk and protective factors influence the way that children respond, one thing we know is true, protecting all people and especially children from violence is crucial and central to the humanitarian imperative. In light of these issues, violence prevention has become a real emphasis and an increased area of emphasis within USAID and especially within BHA. It became part of our internal advocacy strategy, and we've looked for ways to support organizations to build the evidence base on these issues. And we heard from the global community that there is a lack of practical tools by which to do this. Although there's a growing body of evidence around what works to prevent violence, there's still a lot that we don't know, particularly with regard to how to address these issues in humanitarian settings. 
These needs were the impetus for a plan to support this impressive work, and it's part of why BHA provided support for this project. Addressing the root causes of violence is incredibly complex and takes a multi-sectoral approach, which we particularly appreciate within this framework. And by piloting and adapting this framework in multiple contexts, the global child protection community has the opportunity to better understand what works to prevent violence and also how programming can be made more effective. Although the development of this framework is now complete, we know that the real work now begins as organizations can use and pilot this in multiple contexts and roll it out across the global community of practice. At BHA, we look forward to following the use and adaptation of this framework, and we welcome the findings and collaboration that will emerge. In light of the enormity of the challenges facing children globally and the detrimental effects that exposure to violence can have, we welcome the work of the Alliance, Plan International and child protection actors across the world as you all seek to make the world safer and help children not only survive, not only survive but thrive and, and live to their fullest potential. Thank you for your time today and I look forward to further discussion around these issues. Thank you so much for these remarks and food for thought, Debbie. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to join us um, on this launch. And we once again, thank BHA for your support of this resource. Um, I will now hand the mic over to Toby Mbaya from Plan International in Nigeria for a case study from Northeastern Nigeria. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Toby Mbaya and I'm from Plan International Nigeria. I'm based in the northeastern state of Borno State. I'll be talking about um, the case study of how a multi-sectoral approach that has been uh, um, used in um, implementing the prevention um, framework or prevent, yeah, preventing child protection risk. Um, next slide. Thank you. So just a brief overview of um, the context. Um, uh, basically, educating vulnerable and hard to reach girls and adolescent girls in northeastern Nigeria is a project that is funded by the Canadian um, government and it is designed specifically to address gender inequalities, um, tackling root causes of harm and barriers to girls' education, including forms of sexual and gender based violence in two conflict affected states of uh, Borno and Jobe. We're implementing across six local governments. And so the project um, adopts two strategy in addressing the um, root causes. So we have the demand uh, strategy, which looks at addressing gender barriers at the individual household and community level, which enables an increase in demand for education. And then we have the supply path that looks at uh, addressing quality challenges in the formal and non-formal schools to help girls and boys in these communities to access um, to access appropriate pathways to return to education, continue their learning and progress through school, including through transition points. So at the beginning of the project, um, a baseline um, assessment was conducted to identify some of the uh, protection risk that uh, girls, uh, adolescent girls face within our context. So some of which have been a peer environment. It was discovered that although um, most of the girls are aware of their rights, that um, awareness or knowledge is not shared by um, the boys. As such, it puts the girls at risk. And then we have household gender roles. This is as a result of harmful gender norms that um, caregivers and parents hold. As, uh, as such, it causes a challenge or a barrier to education for the girls. Then we have community perceptions. Now, household gender norms or roles also trickle into the community. As such, men and women are put into different roles that so some of which can be harmful to girls and, cause, um, and pose protection risk. Then protection due to conflict. Um, we all know that girls, um, children, especially girls, adolescent girls also uh, are at a higher risk during conflict. And this is a com concept that we're, this is a context that we're working in presently. Finally, financial constraints. 
Now we're going to look at the solution that the project has adopted. I would like to state at this point that this is um, a, a, an education project, um, education-based project. However, we've adopted the multi-sectoral approach in addressing this. So we have a huge gender comp component. We have a um, bit of um, um, livelihood support also. So what are we doing to support um, the girls or to address um, the protection risk that uh, have been identified? Um, so we have the, at the adolescent level, that is at the demand level, we have a life skills training for adolescent girls and boys, provision of financial support and vouchers for adolescent girls enrolled in schools. We have adolescent girl-friendly discussion groups and out of school girls club. Um, we have parenting sessions for parents and caregivers of adolescent girls. At the community level, we're looking at um, training. We were providing training for community leaders, women organizations, and uh, religious leaders to support girls' education and delay marriage. We also have um, we have community-led uh, dialogues. Excuse me. We have community-led dialogues to support education. Um, we have broadcasts of um, social behavioral change messaging, and also we have training of teachers um, on gender responsive pedagogy, psychosocial support, and the likes of it. Now we're going to look at some of the challenges that we have faced in implementing this project. Um, low participation from female stakeholders in some of our activities and meetings. Um, as a result of prevailing gender norms, we realize or we have noticed that um, when working with stakeholders, some of uh, key positions are not held by, by women. As such, we have low representation. But also, uh, the, in at the larger context, during trainings or the likes of it, sometimes uh, women are uh, excused from such meetings or some such um, meetings or webinars and um, seminars and the likes of them because they would have to attend to um, extra chores at home and the likes of it. So this has um, this is one of the challenges. Then findings from baseline and discussions with community stakeholders reveal that the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the burden of care on women and girls. Then there's also low turnout of uh, male parents and caregivers, which may be attributed to participation in income generating activities. Mm -hmm. This is also apparent in older adolescent boys. Um, this is um, very common in the uh, life skill sessions that we have for adolescent boys and also in the parenting sessions. However, we found a way to negotiate the timing of the activity to, in, order that, uh, in order to increase participation. Then recruitment and engagement of the community-based ad hoc staff, such as community mobilizers, community volunteers um, to, from each target community has also posed a challenge due to the number of activities that we're conducting that is geared towards adolescent girls. This has been a challenge. And low participation of girls and um, young women with disabilities in, in the project has also caused, um, is also um, a challenge. Um, due to existing social, structural, and systemic barriers. Now we're going to look at the impacts um, that we have noticed so far. Although this project is ongoing, it's a three-year project, uh, the sessions are ongoing. However, we've started receiving feedback, positive feedback from both parents, community members, adolescent girls and boys about the impacts of the project. Um, for example, one of the um, participants of our life skill session had an improved knowledge on various ways they can identify and mitigate GBV risk in their communities. Uh, for example, specific, I'm going to talk about one of the topics, which is living free of GBV. An adolescent girl who participated in the life skills session in one of the community risks was, um, was able to identify a challenge, um, with, especially with uh, ch child early and forced marriage, reach out to the community mobilizers, and then they were able to engage with the parents, and that was averted. So these are... Um, um, these are some of the impact stories that we have gotten. However, both, um, the names have, have been changed to um, protect their identity. So um, one, of the, um, the adult mem one of the participants of out of school girls session has um, talked about, I'm just going to read a direct quote. My mother always made me to do all the house chores, including washing my 10 year old brother's uniform. Today through the girl friendly discussions with Plan International, I learned about gender socialization and stereotypes and how to communicate assertively. I discussed with my mom and on, and on what I was taught and my brother now washes his clothes and helps me with some of the house chores. Then from one of our male participants, 
in um, Damatru. Um, before now, my peers can testify that I love to fight and I couldn't communicate with my parents effectively when I'm in trouble or in need. However, through the intervention of Life Skills Program by Plan International, I cannot communicate well and life without violence. So this is some of the, the um, feedback that we're receiving from our community. However, towards the end of the project, um, assessments will be carried out to gather quantitative, both quantitative and qualitative um, data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Toby, for this presentation and uh, on this very exciting project. Um, we look forward to hearing about how it progresses and what the next steps are. Um, with this in mind, you may now be wondering, OK, so what is prevention? Um, so next up, we will have Susan, uh, who led the development of the framework, um, introduce this exciting resource. Thank you, Susan. Great, thanks, Michelle. And hi, everyone. So I'm going to give a bit of a guided tour, I guess, to the, the primary prevention framework and discuss a little bit how it can be used um, by all of us in our own work. So let's start with looking at what is the purpose of the prevention framework. So you can see the text here that's been lifted from the framework, but there are three really um, essential elements. So the first is that this is guidance for humanitarian workers. This includes child protection actors, but it's broader than that. Um, primary prevention is often going to be a multi-sectoral initiative. Um, as we saw in Toby's uh, example, that it was actually an education um, program. So while we expect that primary prevention is going to be led, often led or coordinated by child protection actors, it actually needs the support of all humanitarian workers. So that's why it's um, not just for child protection actors. Second, if we look at what are the key actions and considerations to apply in programming. So this is not a step-by-step -step guide that says, if you have harmful child labor, here is the intervention you do to uh, prevent it. This guidance is looking at the range of all different types of harmful outcomes to children, um, the types of violence, exploitation, abuse, and neglect, and then gives kind of guideposts of how um, in any context, you can then contextualize those to fit your specific situation. And then third, uh, this is to prevent harm to children in humanitarian settings. So specifically, it's focused on humanitarian settings. And it's also specifically looking at primary prevention. All right, so when we look at what is in the framework, it starts by looking at what is primary prevention in child protection in humanitarian action and all the little concepts that kind of go around it. So. This diagram that we have on the screen was taken from the, the framework itself, and it shows the prevention and response side of, uh, of CPHA. So we can see at the top level, we have the, the one that's shaded in purple. It's the biggest part of the pyramid, and this is primary prevention. It's the biggest part because it's our biggest target group. So in primary prevention, we're going to be targeting all children in a population. So that could be a community, it can be a refugee camp, it could be a district, it could even be at national level. Um, but what you're targeting is all children to reduce the likelihood of harm happening to any of them. And this goes along with other levels of prevention that we more typically do, I think, in child protection in humanitarian responses. Um, for example, in secondary, prevention, we are um, working with groups of children we've identified to be at high risk. Um, and then in tertiary prevention, as well as response, that's where we're working with individual children who've already experienced harm, and now we want to prevent that from happening again. Um, but really, in primary prevention, we have this wide uh, focus on all children in a population, and that's what really distinguishes it from the other levels. Um, and as Michelle was saying, it's like a vaccine. We don't just vaccinate um, those who have been sick or those who are most vulnerable. We um, vaccinate everyone to prevent, um, in this case, harmful outcomes. Okay, so 
next, oh, um, just to say, so today we're not gonna show this video, but because we have the, the great examples from, um, from Plan, from Nigeria, and also from AVSI um, after this, but there is a short animated video that the Alliance put together that also explains what primary prevention is, and it can be a useful um, tool for your own understanding or to share with others. So you can find that on the uh, Prevention Initiative webpage of the Alliance as well. Okay, so the next parts of the framework look, look at how we operationalize or how we implement primary prevention programming. And to kind of summarize, there are four main things we need to know. Um, and they're all equally important. So they're one, 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 one on the slide. And um, the first thing is what are the main harmful outcomes in to children in a population? So is it harmful child labor? Is it child neglect? Um, and this is something we're always assessing um, in our work if we're doing response or prevention, but it's equally important for prevention. The second thing we need to know is what are the risk factors and protective factors that are associated with those harmful outcomes. So this is something that we're not necessarily always assessing um, in humanitarian responses, but it is essential for um, primary prevention work or prevention work in general. Um, for example, risk factors would be, as Toby shared in her presentation, it was harmful gender norms, it was the peer environment or financial constraints. So we have to look at those. And then we need to think about, third, what are the in interventions that we can do to either reduce those risk factors or increase the protective factors, again, at the population level. And then finally, uh, we need to measure our prevention programming. And this is the one that always comes up as the, the challenge. How do we measure something that hasn't happened, that's been prevented from happening? Well, we can do this first by um, measuring the reduction in risk that we've identified or the increase in the impact of protective factors um, because that's the level our interventions are at. Um, so at a minimum, we can always do that. If it's safe, if we have access, we can also try to measure the actual change in the harmful outcome. So did, for example, harmful child labor reduce or not? Um, but we can at least always do the first measurement. Okay, so within the, the framework, there are two kind of ways of operationalizing this. And the first is by looking at key actions that we can take in each step of the program cycle. So there are two to four key actions um, for each step of the program cycle. And um, this diagram on the, on the slide comes from the framework. And then within the framework, there is further explanation on, on each of the key actions. There are also links to resources to help you implement those actions. And there are some examples. Um, so this gives a really practical way that you can just check, okay, as I go through you know, my planning, my preparation, my implementation and evaluation, did I do all of the key steps needed for prevention programming? And then second, we also have the eight principles for um, effective primary prevention intervention. So these came out of a desk review that was done by the Alliance about a year and a half ago, where they looked at, I think, nearly 500 documents. And um, these came out as kind of the, the important ingredients in successful primary prevention uh, interventions. So we have being context specific. So making sure you know the specific risk and protective factors. Um, ensuring you address multiple levels of the socioecology. So great if you're working at the level of the child, but it will be more impactful if you're working at the level of the child, the family, community, and society. Of course, that can be with um, coordination of different actors. And then use a multi-sector holistic approach. Ensure you're measuring outcomes. Number five, ensure we're using a strength-based approach. So not just trying to reduce risk, but also trying to boost the protective factors um, and the resiliency of communities, of families, of children. And then number six, 
facilitate community ownership. So in primary prevention, we're looking for long-term impacts and thanks. And um, we want to make sure that our initiatives continue. So it's really important to, to ensure there's community ownership, be child-centered and inclusive. Um, inclusivity is super important um, when we're looking at targeting all children in a population. We don't want to leave any group of children behind. And then bridging development and humanitarian systems. So in particular, there's a lot of work that can be done on prevention um, during the preparedness phase. And this is a great opportunity for coordination between development and humanitarian actors and systems. Okay, so in addition uh, to those two sections, there's a final section that goes through um, and discusses some of the key questions around, um, around primary prevention, such as working with short-term or long-term uh, funding um, time timeframes looking at um, behavior change or awareness raising activities. Um, and then that is kind of the, the summary of what is in the framework. Um, and there's a summary version that, can, that goes through those main points. And then the full version goes into more details. Okay, so just quickly, how do we use the framework then? Um, so four key ways, we can use it to understand what primary prevention is in CPHA. We can have a kind of checklist with eight principles as a reminder to make sure that we're applying those in each step. And within the, um, the main framework, there's also some concrete suggestions on how you can apply each of those principles. Um, third, we can also just use it as a checklist as well that we're doing the key actions um, at each step of the program cycle. And then finally, to advocate for quality primary prevention interventions. Um, yeah, we, I think advocacy with, uh, with humani humanitarian coordinators, with uh, managers, with donors, um, on this framework, we can say that we know how to do uh, primary prevention programming, we have guidance to do it, we know it's essential to fulfilling our responsibility to children, um, so I hope this will also be a great advocacy tool. And then finally, I just wanted to share that there are some other resources um, that the Alliance has developed that really support use of the framework. Um, and these are all uh, the ones that are listed here. They're all in the Prevention Initiative website um, or web page of the Alliance website. So you can find them there. And I think Michelle has shared the link as well in the chat. So that's what I had for you. And I'll hand it back over to Michelle, thanks. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, I thank you for providing this excellent overview of the framework. Um, and I want to thank you again uh, for your leadership in its development. Uh, you were able to bring together a large coalition of child protection actors to weigh in and review this resource, keeping in mind the needs of field level colleagues at every step. Um, so thank you so much. We were able to collect feedback from you know, colleagues at field level, we were able to consult with um, a wide variety of actors, and I really appreciate the um, how you have built that uh, coalition and brought in such an interagency perspective. So thank you for that. Um, I would also like to take a moment to thank Anne-Laure Bellieu, um, who I see has joined us today, um, for the immense work that she did on the prevention desk review synthesis. As Susan mentioned, I believe nearly 500 documents were reviewed for this, um, and the um, and this review of the literature really formed the foundation of the eight principles for effective primary prevention. So, um, thanks go out to you, Anne Laura, for your work as well. Um, we will now have a final case study from Joyce Laker, um, and this is just a quick reminder that please don't forget to share any questions that you have about the framework, about our case studies in the chat or in the Q&A box. We look forward to answering them at the end of the launch. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I am Joyce Lake. I work for AFSI Foundation in Uganda. Based, I am based in Northern Uganda, in the district of Gulu. 
today we are going to look at a case study that looks at improving the quality of life of children living with a physical disability in Northern Uganda. So let's have a look at this. Yes, uh, this project has been ongoing for the last eight years in Northern Uganda. For those of us who read history, Northern Uganda had a long war for more than 20 years. And because of this, uh, there has been a great number of incidences of disability as a result of limited access to health services to prevent uh, disability or morbidity of diseases like polio, spina bifida and others. So this project that is ongoing has objectives looking at improvement of quality of life of children with the disabilities and how to improve or enhance the psychological well-being of the children in the communities in Northern Uganda. So the risk factor that we are looking at here is the negative social norms around disabilities. Culturally, uh, how do people view persons with disability in the region? So there are a lot of uh, negative perceptions. People uh, associate disability with bad domains, that it is a punishment, and many people do not want to identify with any child or any person with disability. So this is a risk factor that the project looked at. Let's continue. Yeah, uh, so uh, as a primi primary prevention, our project looked at how do we challenge the negative attitudes of the community towards disabilities. So we conducted a lot of a number of activities, one of which was conducting family dialogues where we talk about disability, the causes of disability, and how do we work with the children who are living with disability in our families. Or even during community sensitizations, we discuss together the challenges, and then we come, we agree together as a community, as a family, how do we ensure that any child that is born tomorrow with disability is not stigmatized, is provided all the support that this child needs. And then also as OFSI, we are able to conduct uh, inclusive education training for the different teachers in the different schools so that our teachers have general knowledge on how to work with children with disability. During this inclusive education, we only not focus on teachers, but the whole community, so the society, like the children and the pupils, how do I live and how do I work with my colleagues, study with my colleagues who's living with physical disability? Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, we do not stop at the primary prevention, we also look at secondary prevention. Now that we already have children who are living with physical disability, what do we provide to ensure that uh, there is inclusion for these children? So we provided physical rehabilitation, we provide physiotherapy, occupation therapy, we give mobility plans. And then those children who are incontinent, we train them how to conduct on continence management such that they remain dry and they're accepted in schools and classes, and then that they are not stigmatized. Also, we looked at provision of mental health and psychosocial support to not only the children who are living with disabilities, but even the caregivers and the parents and so that they're able to cope up with the stress that comes up with taking care of this child with disability so that these parents are able to better provide for these children. And then because of also the widespread poverty, as a secondary profession, we also looked at establishment of income generating activities and establishing village saving and a loan association to the parents of these children with disability so that at least the little that they get, they are able to provide for these children. We realize that uh, in the families where children with disability exist, also already with the poverty that is in, there is a lot of things that happen. You need to divide this small income into the frequent medical services for this child with disability, and also for school fees and terms to cut up for other things that the family needs. So we said, okay, let's do this. Let's establish income generating activities and really saving a loan association for our parents. So that even as they're in group, they're able to be referred to the government facilities and able to get some support from the government. Yes, please. Now we face a lot of challenges. We realize that even in our eight years of projects, there are very many children with disability that we cannot all 
assess so that they're able to access and receive the necessary support. So the gap remains anonymous. And then because of also the widespread poverty in Northern Uganda, it makes it very challenging, as I already said, for many families of children with disability to really provide adequately for these children, even in spite of all the empowerment that we give them at a lower level. However, uh, as we continue to see in our next, in, in our next term, yes, the impact. We are saying that uh, intervention was conducted eight years ago, however, in a relatively stable context. The war has since uh, stopped. Many families have gone back to their original homes and villages. So uh, with the assessment, we have observed that there has been an increase in positive attitude towards children with disabilities within the communities. How they perceive them, even when we go for visits that we have not uh, alerted the family community, you'll find a child is included, is actively playing, and is also being sent to school. We have also noticed increased perception of ability of the children themselves to participate in community activities. With me, most of the time, the children, they think that they cannot do anything. But uh, with this intervention, we have seen increased ability for these children to participate in, in uh, different activities with the rest of the children. And this has improved their inclusion. And then even on enrollment of school age children with disabilities in schools. In the past, uh, most parents, they first send the children that they consider to be able-bodied in school and leave out this child with disability. But with the project intervention, we have seen an increase in the number of children that are enrolled or sent to school. And we are happy about that. We have also seen an uh, increased engagement of fathers in care of children with disabilities. Traditionally, children are cared for by their mothers and more so even the grandmothers who they themselves are also limited in a lot of ways. And the fathers leave all the, these responsibilities to everybody. But I want to say that uh, we have seen increased engagement of fathers care of children with disability. And then of, of course, also the general health condition of these children. Many times they had, there was reduction in ways that they live, they were malnourished that affected their health. But because of the different interventions, like in the secondary prevention phase, they were able to have some improvement in their nutrition status. And then last but not least, uh, we have seen improved social inclusion and also participation of these children among their peers, acceptance in communities, because also the children, they are accepting their conditions. And then they, in a way that they have also learned skills, how do I even live in this community where maybe not everybody perceives me as a human being, but I myself, because I have been counseled, I've accepted who I am, I have self-esteem, and then I continue to also live in this society and participate. Let's continue. So uh, in this slide, uh, you are going to see uh, one of the parents who's busy supporting the project team who has gone to the community to provide home-based care. There's a photo there. There's a parent who's making parallel bar for this child who's living with disability in the community. Something before the intervention we are not able to see. There's a child who had weakness of the lower limb and we are using the available material in the community so that this child, instead of going many kilometers away from home to seek for physiotherapy, or occupational therapy in the hospital, the parents can already support this child to learn how to stand and walk. So in that photograph, you can see that. Let's continue. Yeah, uh, ideally, that is a brief from my side for now. Thank you so much for listening. Back to Thank you, Michelle. You. Thank you so much, Joyce, for um, your interesting presentation and your engaging case study. Um, and I'd like to thank, again, all of our presenters who have shared, um, who have shared case studies or shared experiences today. Um, we will now move to the Q&A segment. Um, so we have several questions that have come in through the Q&A function and the chat. Um, and so I think the first question I would have is for um, Joyce and for Toby. Um, if you could please share 
what's it, an interesting question is how to measure the effectiveness of prevention programming, since the ultimate goal is that you know the harmful outcome won't happen. Um, could you share a bit about um, how you are measuring the effectiveness of the prevention activities? And so that is a question for Joyce and for Toby. Okay, um, thank you very much for that question. So I would like to start by saying that um, the way the activities are planned, such as the life skill sessions for adolescent girls and boys, is such that we have um, routine monitoring. So um, the monitoring aspect is embedded in the um, program. And um, the whole idea is to have to get um, qualitative data through focus group discussions and observations from um, the participants, especially adolescent girls, about their um, about the impact and of the um, program or the activity. It's uh, the same thing too with the out of school girls session. So that that is what we use, and then feedback that we get from them, we use it in. Um, um, addressing gaps that have been identified, and then also collecting um, uh, multiple success stories like I shared el earlier. However, we have, uh, like I mentioned, um, there's going to be a final assessment at the end of this um, particular cohort. So we have two cohorts planned for this particular, for the different, for all the activities anyways. So at the end of each cohort, we're going to carry out an, um, um, an um, assessment or so evaluation to see the impact and then also to identify or to um, see the knowledge in so we don't just want to talk about um what has what they have impacted or what, yes what they have gotten or how their lives have been impacted but also want to see the uh, knowledge um gained through this whole session so these are the two ways that we're measuring impact thank Great. you thank you toby that's very clear um looking forward to hearing about the results of the evaluation um Joyce, how are how is AFSI measuring impact in terms of prevention activities? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we also do a lot of evaluation and monitoring. As a project uh, in our monitoring and evaluation, we ensure that uh, we involve uh, the beneficiaries themselves and their caregivers, and then the community leaders to check uh, the impact uh, of the project in the lives of these children in the community. And then also, for example, in schools uh, where we have uh, provided inclusive education training to teachers, uh, we take it upon ourselves uh, to check uh, the number of enrollment of children with disability in this school. Because many times uh, you find in a school, a lot of school, they'll say, for us, we do not take care of children with disability, maybe because we don't have the facilities, but in most cases, we are realized is uh, about uh, attitudes. So uh, once uh, we conduct this uh, inclusive education training, we see that there's an increase in the number of enrollment of these children. And a lot of schools in the community are able to accept a child with disability, irrespective of the nature of disability. And then also, as we talk to the children, uh, we, we perceive uh, that uh, they are better placed now than before intervention from the project. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Joyce. Um, my next question is for Susan. So we had a question from Varsha in the chat around whether or not we have, um, whether or not the framework focuses on, you know, enabling parents um, for positive parenting, the care of the children and preparing adolescents for humanitarian situations. So I think, the question that kind of distilled us down a bit is how does this framework address more specific concerns of um, of programming and implementation and supporting um, parents and adolescents? Okay, thanks. Um, I think the the preparing both adolescents and parents to prepare um, their families and their children are definitely a part of the framework. Um, if you look at the key actions in the preparedness section, um, what is, is given is that um, before a crisis starts, uh, it makes sense to both look at the harmful outcomes that are already existing um, in the population and try to prevent those, but also look at the harmful outcomes that are 
possible um, when the crisis strikes and already seen what can we do in advance to mitigate or to prevent uh, it from happening before the crisis, as well as having a plan in place for what are we going to do to prevent it during the crisis. Um, and so once you identify what are those risk factors and those protective factors for those harmful outcomes, you can already start to work with parents and with adolescents on, on addressing those. And I think that's really um, key for prevention. Um, secondly, um, one of the principles was, of course, um, being child-centered and inclusive, and this includes having children and adolescents um, being active participants at every step of the program cycle for your prevention programming. Um, so definitely ensuring that they have an active role is part of that. Um, in terms of saying specifically adolescents should do this or parents should do this, it doesn't give specific programming advice because um, this is looking again at the range of context of different harmful outcomes of different settings. Um, so it's giving you those guideposts to think about then, okay, so if uh, family separation we think will be possible in this context, if I don't know, the volcano erupts, or if there is increased conflict, then let's already think about what would be the risk factors. If that's maybe, um, you know, not having the knowledge about where to go, let's make sure children know where to go um, in case of that event, you know, that event happens, um, or giving them information to ensure that they know how to protect themselves from dangers and injuries. So um, it depends on the specific context, but definitely, um, those, those steps are included. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, we have a question from Hugh from the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. Um, and this question is directed towards, actually, I believe every presenter might have something interesting to say in response. Um, Hugh's interested in hearing about the workforce that carries out primary prevention activities. Um, in the examples in Nigeria and Uganda, it was NGO staff or volunteers engaged for the duration of the contract or were long-term, so I guess whether um, it was NGO staff and volunteers engaged with um, AFC and PLAN or were long-term local social service workers involved from local government or community and whether as professionals, paraprofessionals or community volunteers. So I guess what is the workforce carrying out prevention work? And I think That'd be interesting to hear from Toby and Joyce in terms of your specific um, um, examples, and then as well as from Susan in terms of overall who might be carrying out prevention work. Um, so perhaps we can start with Toby and then go to Joyce and then Susan. Okay, um, about Sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah, um, thank you for the question. So um, yes, we're, um, the workforce, of course, we have a um, um, huge part of the workforce being NGO staff, um, community um, volunteers, community mobilizers, and the likes of it. However, what we've ensured to do is, um, what we've done is ensure that um, for staff that are based in the communities are recruited from these communities. And so what we're doing is improving or building the capacity of the community members. But we're also working closely with community structure. So we have the child um, community-based child protection committees. We have the school-based um, management committees. Then we have uh, dialogue sessions also with community leaders. So what we're doing is also building those structures. Um, then at the government level, we ensure that um, we have particular activities that are get towards building the um, capacity of our gov government stakeholders. But because the project is um, education based, we ensure that we're working with school teachers, um, the local government authorities and the likes of them and training them. Some of them have moved on to become master trainers. So we're ensuring that institutional capacity is also built. And um, so that is basically the picture for us. I hope I answered the question. You definitely did, and I think you're touching upon a, an important point um, in that uh, prevention programming can be carried out by virtually any humanitarian actor. So child, you know, primary prevention programming for child protection to prevent harmful outcomes for children, it's not just child protection actors that are involved. Um, Joyce, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, for our case, uh, our project worked in the rehabilitation setup in the regional referral hospital. 
And there we have uh, a number of uh, persons who work with these children in preventive care, like the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, the orthopedic workers who give uh, mobility plans. We have the social workers. We have the psychologists. But also in the community, work with the community-based reputation workers whom we have trained. And then also the parent support group of this the, the parent support group uh, comprises of parents of these children living with disability. And of course, the cultural leaders, the local leaders. So you realize that uh, a lot of actors we work with together in this primary prevention. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joyce. And then uh, Susan, is there any last comments that you would like to add from more of the perspective of the, of the framework overall? No, I think Joyce and Toby and, and you have said everyone uh, can do primary prevention efforts. Maybe just to add that um, it's important to look at what's already existing to prevent uh, harm to children and supporting those actors, the children themselves or community members or community groups um, to, to keep going with those, those actions or help them to do more. Um, but yeah, everyone is the short answer. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I'd like to direct this question to Toby and Joyce one more time. Um, so for Toby and Joyce, uh, do you have plans to further increase the use of primary prevention activities? And do you anticipate this becoming a, you know, you know, more of a, you know, more integrated into your general programming on child protection? I'll hand um, it to Toby thank first. you. Okay, thank you for that question. So um, yes, we do. I can say that at a uh, as at an organizational level, um, our Plan International is looking more into integrated approach of um, programming. And um, of course, we don't view child protection as a standalone program. We what we see it is um, it's um, we see child protection as a basis for every implementation. And what we're doing um, together with um, the different um, leads and the likes of it is to see how um, child protection is uh, part of the benchmarks of the different, um, different things. So beyond education, we're looking at livelihood, we're looking at nutrition, and then ensuring that um, the prevention framework, of course, speaks to every activity. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. And Joyce, are you looking towards doing more prevention activities? I would say yes. Uh, as an organization, uh, all the staff, is a, there's a policy in our organization that uh, each staff and even uh, the suppliers or the stakeholders with whom we work, they sign what we call child protection policy. So I would say that uh, as an organization, as a number of projects, not only in earth related or protection and other things, but uh, yes, we ensure that uh, child protection is really embedded, especially primary prevention, and we continue to work with. At the moment, we are not only working with the children with disabilities, but even children in general, especially in areas of education, sending children to school. Yes. Thank you so much, Joyce. I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. I know there are some questions remaining, so we will do our best to make sure that those questions are answered. Um, in comments on the when the video is eventually posted to the Alliance YouTube page. Um, so we will do our best to answer all questions. Now, thank you for joining us today. Um, you may be asking yourself, what can I do now to promote primary prevention in my work? So we have a couple of ideas for you. You can share the prevention framework with your colleagues. I will drop the link in the chat once more for you. Um, is grab it. So you can share the prevention framework with your colleagues. You can include primary prevention in future funding applications. You can think about how can we begin working this into our programming. We know that with humanitarian response, it's short funding cycles and it's difficult and prevention is a long term approach. However, even slowly, slowly, we can begin adding in more primary prevention to our programming. If you are doing primary prevention work already, please share the case studies, success stories, lessons learned with the Alliance Prevention Initiative um, at the email address that you see on the uh, 
PowerPoint screen, prevention at alliancecpha.org. We would love to hear about other primary prevention work ongoing so that we can then share that knowledge and experience with the broader community. Um, and you can advocate within your organization on the importance of primary prevention, whether you are calling in to us from a country office or from a regional office or an HQ, or if you're a donor, this is a very important area of work for child protection heading into the future. It is one of the four strategic priorities for the Alliance. Um, and we would really love to see this framework taken up and piloted and implemented by child protection actors globally. Um, so please advocate within your organization, help other, you know, your multi-sector colleagues understand why prevention is important and how they can play a role in preventing harm to children. And just, you know, reach out to us with any questions or any need for support in the future. Um, on that note, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, thank you for your time and your attention. And I'd like to Send a special thanks to Hani and Audrey for their support throughout the development of this resource. Um, and I would like to thank our panelists again, Susan, Toby, and Joyce for your time and your um, wisdom. And thank you again to Debbie from BHA for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.